Hello and welcome back to Genetic Counseling Interface. This week I wanted to cover a topic that again is a little more in the realm of application advice, but is something that I've been thinking of as I've gotten further into the school year and realized some things that I did as an applicant that I think were silly. So without further ado, I want to go through a few questions that I asked in my genetic counseling interviews that I think um, were kind of a waste of time or didn't reflect well on me and maybe some questions that could be good alternatives. First, this is a huge one. I had a habit of asking about like academic support resources because I was terrified of this fact that I learned, I think in my second cycle, that all genetic counseling programs will fail you if you have less than an 80% in a class, which is, I suppose, factually true. Um, however, it's not really set up like undergrad, where what I'm thinking is, I'm coming at the time of my interview from the perspective of a student who had just been through the six or seven courses of chemistry that really exist to weed out pre-meds. If 80% had been a failing grade in undergrad, I would have failed countless tests and probably a couple of classes, which is why I came into my genetic counseling interviews and was like, please tell me about your support resources if you feel somebody is at risk of falling below 80%. Now this to me seemed like an important question and I suppose it would be an important question, except I didn't realize that genetic counseling school is structured differently and that our classes aren't meant to be weeder classes. Like the whole point of our classes is to get us to pass and to get information that will prepare us to pass the boards and be genetic counselors. They're also really small classes, my class being the biggest at 26 people and every other program being smaller classes. So it's not that they don't have academic support resources, it's not like they're not important. It's just that by asking that, I think it came off that I was insinuating that I would be at the bottom of the class and that I would need academic support resources, which just hasn't turned out to be true. Um, just the way the classes are structured, most of our classes are pretty straightforward on their expectations and are graded in a way that, you know, your best effort should be an 80% or more. It's not going to be like organic chemistry where it's a typical thing to get a 40 on a quiz. And even embryology, which I would say is graded quite hard, is still curved in a way that like the lowest grade in the class is going to be an 80. So I just wouldn't like stress too much about the 80% minimum and I wouldn't go like asking about like, oh, what if somebody's like at risk of being below 80%. There's structures in place and you don't want to call attention to your insecurities. Next, I, this is more like a category. I wouldn't place a label on a program or ask them to place a label on themselves. And what I mean by that is in my first cycle especially, I would come into programs and be like, you guys have a research focus, tell me more about what that means to you. But like, they didn't. <laughs> the reality is, all the programs are pretty much the same. <laughs> They're, they all have almost identical coursework, they all have logbook, um, that you fill out with your different kinds of rotations that you do. You have to do prenatal, you have to do cancer, you have to do peds. You have to learn all the information that's gonna be on the board exam. Just because they're all accredited by the same institution, the programs are quite similar to each other and the differences are gonna be in location and in class culture and not in this is a psychosocial program, this is a research program, this is a counseling program. The reality is they're all genetic counseling programs, so they're all all of that. So I just wouldn't recommend like asking about, are you a research program or a psychosocial program? Or what makes you a psychosocial program? It just doesn't make a lot of sense. It's labels that applicants give to programs that I gave to programs that isn't really real. 
my next piece of advice is charge a tripod battery because now we are in the dark, but that's okay. Um, this one is gonna be shorter, but I, especially when I interviewed at Rutgers and when I interviewed here at Sarah Lawrence, I think I spent a little too much time asking about housing because this area is new to me and it made me nervous. And not that you can't ask about what it's like to live in the area. That's okay, that's a valid question. I think that my housing questions probably though were a waste of time in the interview because my interviewers were full grown genetic counseling adults and probably don't ponder too much on the availability of, of studios and Yonkers. So if you have questions about cost of living or what kind of housing is available or how people found their housing, definitely a much better question for the students than in the interview proper. And then last question that I think that I asked that I didn't need to was asking about like specialty rotations or how do you foster special interest? Not that this is a bad question. I think you could use it if you were really out of other questions, but I think that pretty much every program would give you the same answer. Um, the way that rotations work is you can either let the program choose for you or you can seek out your own. So if you have a special interest that you're really committed to, then you would just be doing your own legwork to find that kind of rotation. So say you were interested in ocular genetics, you could go find a summer in that and nobody's gonna stop you at, at any program, really, as far as I know. So it's not really like you have to find a program that has an ocular genetics rotation that can be reserved for you. Um, if I was really interested in that at Sarah Lawrence, it's not something that we have a rotation for, but they would just tell me to find one myself. So if you have special interest, you can write your thesis on it. You can seek out your own rotation. Um, I just wouldn't go spending a lot of time trying to get programs to say that they foster special interest or ranking them based on how you think that they foster special interest. Because again, it comes back to like the class sizes are small and they care about you as an individual and your program directors at any program are gonna do their best to foster your interest in your success. And now brought to you by the Christmas tree, here are a few questions that I think I should have asked that I didn't. So in the age of COVID-19 especially, I wish that I had asked a little bit more about what the technology is like at the program. This might have required me to be a mind reader and see that everything was going to end up going online, although it really only happened a couple weeks after my interview here and happened like concurrently while I was interviewing with Baypath, but of course they're a little different because they're already online. But my point is, um, I think some programs have turned out to be more prepared than others for this transition into remote learning and using like online assignments. And I wish I had asked my programs how they work with technology, how they do, like do they train for telehealth? Do they have the capability to Zoom classes? And of course, I didn't know that this kind of stuff would be an issue, but people applying in the next class do, so. I would suppose that this would apply differently for the next class interviewing, like ask your programs how it's been going with the transition to virtual and how their students have been reacting to it. Um, do their students still feel involved? Do their students feel that the online platform, the online learning has been easy to use? Because I know people have had certain complaints about the way online learning has gone. And I think that you can learn a lot about the way that the program uh, fosters their students' needs by seeing how they've reacted to the pandemic. So then I would also ask about what's a piece of feedback that they've gotten from students in the past few years that they've been able to implement. Um, I didn't really see the importance of being able to give feedback to your program until I got into the program here at SLC. And now that I'm in a big class and there's lots of us and lots of us have different ideas for the program. Um, I'm seeing how it is important to have some kind of system in place to take the lived experience of the students and translate it into changes if necessary. 
So I think it's really important to make sure that the program that you're going to end up going to has some kind of way for you to be involved in developing your education by giving them feedback on what your experience is and what you'd like your experience to be. Um, next thing, I think that this topic is both something that programs will and should love to discuss and that will be insightful for applicants. And that's asking how the program has reacted to recent events in the genetic counseling field. For example, there's been a big emphasis in the past six months or so on diversity and inclusion. And I think it will be insightful to hear from every program how they've tried to turn that into action. For the Sarah Lawrence program, they've had us join um, these inter-program anti-racism discussion groups and these little mini pods as well that do anti-racism discussions. And I think that it would be uh, helpful to know that the program is that you're considering are taking action on that important current event and are you know having their students put forth effort to be part of necessary changes. As I was following the NSGC chat on Twitter, I also noticed that like non-traditional roles of genetic counselors were a big topic at this year's NSGC. Like, is this a role for a genetic counselor? Are you still part of the field if you go into a you know, sales role or if you become a medical science liaison? And I think it would be insightful to discuss with programs, like, do you feel you adequately prepare your students for the wide variety of genetic counseling roles? What kind of things do you do to make sure that if a student is interested in going into industry or going into sales or medical science, that they're prepared for that? I know SLC had a graduate who went into postmortem genetics, who went into like mystery solving of unexplained deaths and doing genetic testing on the body to see if there might have been a genetic cause. And that's a new field for genetic counselors. And I don't know if that's something that I would do or that I would ever have the opportunity to do. Um, but I was curious how the Sarah Lawrence program had created this person who went into that field. And so I talked about that a lot in my interview with my now professor, Lindsay. And I think that that was a great use of our time because we got to discuss SLC's interest in placing genetic counselors in roles they've never been in before. And we got to discuss how that student came to develop their interest and how other students have been inspired by her. So hopefully these types of questions will spark a more genuine conversation, um, will allow you to see more of the day-to-day -day life in the program, um, the things that really will make a difference between programs since the rotations are all gonna be similar, the coursework is all gonna be similar, you're all preparing for the same exam. What will really make the difference in your experience is the people that you work with and the culture of the program. And hopefully these questions that I presented that I think I should have asked will be helpful for current and future applicants to learn what they really need to about their programs to make the best decision. I have been putting off publishing a little bit, making video content. It's been a little bit tough lately, not because of school. Um, Buddy, laying on the floor here, is unfortunately dying of heart failure and has been for a while. So he is gonna be put down in a few days. Um, it's been kind of hard to film just like logistically because he goes into a lot of coughing fits and choking fits and well, there's nothing I can do about it. I also can't really film while it's happening. At the same time, it's also been really sad to have our last few days together. Um, but hopefully sharing this advice has been helpful and it's definitely taken my mind off of our impending family death in the next few days. And after he passes away, we are planning on adopting a cat. Um, it's something that we wanted to do for a long time, but Buddy doesn't like cats and Buddy is also a handful. <laughs> he has a lot of medical needs, obviously. And 
he's been a financial handful for sure. Um, so after he passes and things settle down, we want to start looking for a sweet cat in a shelter who might like a home with us. So this week is gonna be a little sad, but hopefully after Buddy has his peaceful transition into the great dog park in the sky, um, we can start looking for our new family member in our next chapter.